on our way to Oyster Bay. Mother Jones in her march for children's rights. Written by Monica Culling, illustrated by Felicita Sala. Grabbing a sign, eight-year-old Aiden joined the other striking cotton mill workers. He was a doffer. For 12 hours, six days a week, he and other boys removed full bobbins from the clacking spinning frames. Aiden's friend Gussie was a spinner at the mill. When a thread broke, she quickly repaired it by tying the two ends together. Knowing Aiden couldn't read, Gussie read his sign to him. It says, we want to go to school. Aiden did want to go to school, but his family needed the money he earned. This was the way things were for many children in 1903. There was excitement on the picket line that day. Someone named Mother Jones was coming. She helped workers fight for better wages and safer working conditions. When Aiden met her though, he wondered how. She looks like someone's granny, he whispered to Gussie. Later, Aiden was even more surprised when Mother Jones talked his ma'am and Gussie's too into letting them join a march from Kensington, Pennsylvania to Oyster Bay, New York, over 100 miles away. In her travels, Mother Jones had met hundreds of children working in factories and mills. Many were missing fingers. Some had even lost hands. Troubled by all she had seen, Mother Jones wanted to end child labor. But what could she do? Why, organize a children's march and bring the message right to President Theodore Roosevelt at his summer home in Oyster Bay, of course. A few days after arriving in Kensington, Mother Jones gathered 200 workers, including an excited Aiden, Gussie, and dozen of other children. They marched out of town playing flutes, beating drums, and waving flags. Mother Jones was leading the way to Oyster Bay. The first day of the march seemed like it would never end. But Aiden and Gussie kept each other going. All the same, they were happy when Mother Jones shouted, Camp time! While the tents were being set up, Mother Jones helped some of the women make a large pot of meat and potato stew. It smelled heavenly. Aiden and Gussie ate until they couldn't eat any more. And later, under a blanket of stars, they slept <sighs> as soundly as hibernating bears. The days were long and hot, and the mosquitoes were biting. Each day, a few of the marchers quit, but not Aiden and Gussie. They enjoyed walking through fields of buttercups and visiting new towns, and it felt good to be doing something so important. Besides, if Mother Jones could walk this far, why couldn't they? Aiden wasn't the only one in the group who couldn't read. At the end of the day, Mother Jones read the daily news aloud in her soothing Irish lilt. Some of the stories were even about the march. The march wasn't all buttercups and sunshine, though. One day, the rain fell in torrents, making the dirt roads floppy with thick mud. By nightfall, Aiden and Gussie were exhausted. Somehow, Mother Jones convinced the mayor of the next town to let the marchers spend the night in an empty meeting hall. Soaked to the skin, everyone was grateful for a dry place to rest and a dinner of cold sandwiches. She's something, whispered Aiden before dropping off to sleep. 
The following morning, Mother Jones made a welcome announcement. Today we'll take the train to the next town. We've earned a break, haven't we? Aiden and Gussie shouted, yes, ma'am. Neither had ever ridden on a train before. At first, Gussie and Aiden chased each other up and down the aisle. Once they had enough of that, they watched the passing scenery. It helped them forget how much they missed home and their families. When they arrived, 3,000 people were gathered in the town's public park, waiting to hear Mother Jones speak. All these people care about us? said an astounded Aiden. Gussie was so amazed, she could only nod. Mother Jones spoke with force. These children work 12 hours a day, six days a week. They work while other children go to school, play games, and enjoy life. Inspired, and maybe a bit humbled, many of the townspeople offered their support and places to stay. Finally, a little over two weeks after the march started, the remaining 30 marchers arrived in New York City. It was the last stop before Oyster Bay. Mother Jones was expecting to hold a parade through the city streets and to speak at Madison Square Garden. But the mayor of America's largest city wouldn't allow her to do either. Not one to take no for an answer, Mother Jones simply turned to the marchers and shouted, follow me everyone. Stopping at the corner of 24th Street and 4th Avenue, Mother Jones held her meeting. More than a thousand gathered to listen while the traffic whizzed around them. After the speech, the group started to prepare for the last stretch of the march. But Mother Jones had other plans. Today, my friends, we're going to Coney Island, she said. Gussie gave Aiden a puzzled look. Aiden shrugged. Coney Island was great fun. Aiden and Gussie ate foods they'd never had before. Popcorn and peanuts and hot dogs. Mm. They went on rides called Razzle Dazzle, a circle that spun them dizzy, and Helter Skelter, a slide that took their breaths away. They even saw two girls riding a camel. Although it was a day for having fun, Mother Jones used every opportunity to speak out. While Aiden and Gussie were looking at the wild animals, Mother Jones pulled them close and spoke to people who were gathered nearby. These children are as trapped as the animals in those cages. They are chained to the mills because they are poor and cannot break away. They suffer while you enjoy luxury. These were hard words, but they were the truth. The next day, the marchers walked the last 35 miles to Oyster Bay. It was a long, weary march, but finally they stood on the lawn of the president's summer home, waiting expectantly for him to appear. But President Roosevelt wouldn't speak with Mother Jones. We've come from so far away, said Gussie. Aiden was angry as well as disappointed. How could he do that to us? It's not fair. Mother Jones put her arms around them. She could only agree. On the train back home, everyone was quiet. Only Mother Jones understood what they had achieved with the march. Many people now see that children don't belong in factories, in mills, but in schools, she reminded them. Education will bring society closer to what we want. Fairness for all 
and a better world in which to live. Peyton thought about that. He was proud that he and Gussie had marched with Mother Jones. One day, he would learn to read. And when change came for mill children, he would be part of that too. My question for you today is this. What does Labor Day mean to you? Share with a family member or friend or during coffee hour this week.